I don't remember the, the moment that I became aware of HIV, but I just have this vague recollection of my mom using the phrase, the gay plague. And from our small country home in Rhode Island, I thought, okay, well, it's never going to touch my life. And I was wrong. And um, when I went to graduate school at NYU, uh, it was a three-year program with 15 of us, 15 of students, and we were all very serious, and we had serious teachers teaching us Shakespeare. And then we had this one teacher, Paul Walker, and he was special, and he was different. And he taught us uh, improvisation, and it was the scariest class because there were no rules. And so people would cry on a daily basis in his class. And he would say things like, okay, we're going to do instant Elizabethan drama. Go. And I would just freeze in terror and start crying. <laughs> um, but he would say, you get to do this. Isn't it wonderful? And slowly he taught all of us that in order for us to do what we love, you have to be fearless. And um, then one day he didn't show up to school. And we learned that he had been living with HIV since 1982. This was 1993. And, uh, and he was declining. And very quickly he had AIDS and he was bedridden and the students brought him food every day. And then uh, by the end of my third year, my last year, he was in the hospital and 500 of his students from all over the world flew in to say goodbye. And um, he had a tube in his throat so he couldn't speak and he had a tube in his head so they were draining blood from his brain into a bucket. And one by one, we each went to him and told him that he could go and that we loved him. And the next day at age 41, he was gone. And uh, that changed my life. And from that moment on, I vowed to myself that I would do everything I could to support HIV AIDS programs. And um, I did it quietly for a while, and then I discovered PSI, the NGO that I've been working with for eight years, and um, traveled to Zambia and Zimbabwe with them. And um, I'm going to Malawi in two weeks and so that's really the driving force. I, I named my son after him. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. that's a powerful story. Yeah, that's definitely often that personal connection and knowing someone that often kind of tr triggers that in people and um, that personal connection. And you're not new to using your celebrity mm. um, to shift perceptions, um, starting with your groundbreaking show, Will and Grace, that I think we all remember and loved, um, which... <laughs> which took on discrimination using um, humor. Yes. And you were able to kind of really humanize um, these stories and that you were telling a story of best friends. And so how have you seen the power of a narrative really um, change minds and even policy as we've kind of seen in recent years with um, the recent LGBT rights uh, yeah. movement that we've been kind of seeing across the country? Well, as you, as you mentioned, um, Will and Grace was a, a really good example of how, how narrative can change hearts and perceptions. Um, and I remember that besides the birth of my son, my proudest moment was when I saw our vice president on Meet the Press say that Will and Grace had done more for the issue than any policy or any law. And that really is a testament to our showrunners, one gay, one straight, who um, told the story. It wasn't about a gay f man and a, and a straight woman. It was about friendship and love. And they treated the characters with um, dignity and um, authenticity and endowed them with humanity and humor. And because of that, mm -hmm. everybody embraced them. And, um, and since I've been working with PSI, I've realized that that's how I can help, is that I can be the storyteller. Um, and I've learned that it's very, very important for, for us to, to not speak for the people we're trying to serve, but to, uh, to share their sense of agency and to celebrate what they're able to do. And not talk about them as a disease, but talk about them as a person. And, um, and so when I've been traveling, 
I've been gathering these stories of these extraordinary people and uh, coming back and going on the hill and testifying and, and sharing their stories so that it can uh, hopefully move people to uh, accept it and, and, and make change more readily. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Is there one story in particular? I know you've traveled to several countries and you're looking forward to a trip to Malawi. Is yeah. there one story that kind of stands out to you? Uh, when we went to Zimbabwe, um, we, were, we were traveling around and we went to a testing facility and then we went to a counseling session um, where people had, who had just discovered that they had HIV were all gathering together. And um, this woman, Irene, stood up and she had a newborn baby on her back and another child, a toddler, at her feet. And she told the story of how um, her husband had died years earlier, and she didn't know from what. And then all of a sudden, she was getting sores all over her body, and she was a greeter at church. And the, the head of the church said, you have AIDS, you're going to die, go home, don't come back. And when she told her elder son, he spat in her face, and threw dollars at her and said, go die in a different village. And she wouldn't do it. Um, and then she finally, she went and she got tested and she had HIV. And at this point when I met her, she was, she was on medication and she was getting um, counseled and you know, being supported by a community. And I was just really inspired by her. I mean, I'm a mother. So to see this woman mm -hmm. um, with her two children there and to know the kind of stigma, that you were talking about stigma, I mean, this, you know, that is something that is a huge barrier for all of us. Um, and, and that really, and it also highlighted our need for treatment. Um, the thing about women and girls is that we've left them behind. We've failed them. And 75% of, of all new cases among adolescents will be girls. And so we need to increase the funding to focus on understanding all of the, the factors that go into what makes girls more vulnerable. And that is sexual violence, you know, gender inequality, and lack of schooling. Mm -hmm. um, and so once we start really focusing on those needs, change will come. And I mean, we are so close to getting to an, AID, an AIDS-free generation, but that won't happen unless we focus on, on girls and women. Absolutely, and everyone I think in this room, we have, there's practitioners here, there's people who are on the technical oh. side and even celebrities. Um, what is your sense of wh the different storytellers? Um, who do you think, like, who, what are the different roles that we all kind of play? I know you can use your celebrity, but then also, there's also people who can also just be advocates. What's the um, kind yeah. of your sense of that? I, I think that, I think that what's most important is, is sharing people's stories honestly. Um, and with, and, 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 and talking about their lives uh, with dignity. Uh, I think that's the only way that we can really, really serve people.